Hi, morning, Dr. Nora. Morning. Uh, yeah. So, uh, doctor, is it okay if we proceed with the discussion? Yes. Okay. So, yeah, we shall proceed. Um, very good morning to Dr. Nora and the audience today. Thank you for attending a case by case basic session for today, even though it's a weekend. Um, before we move on to the session, as you can see on the screen, I would like to lay down some ground rules. Um, this session will be recorded, of course, and please keep your microphones muted unless you're prompted to unmute to participate in the discussion. Slides will be given after the feedback form for this session is filled. And if you have any burning questions, please feel free to type it in the chat box and we will attend to them during the Q&A session. Um, if you wish, wish to ask uh, Dr. Nora any questions directly, please feel free to use the raise hand function in the toolbar and unmute yourself to ask the question. Midway interruptions are not encouraged so as to ensure a smooth and enjoyable session. Just feel free to participate actively in our discussion. So, um, here we have us today is uh, here we, we have with us today is Dr. Nora, who is uh, participating at uh, participating Pula, who is a practicing colorectal surgeon in UM Medical Center. She graduated from National University of Ireland with a degree of Bachelor of Medicine of, and of Surgery and of Obstetrics. She then pursued her Master of Surgery in University of Malaya and furthered her fellowship in colorectal surgery in PPUKM and also Royal Prince Alfred Hospital, Sydney. Before we move on to the case, Doctor, do you have anything that you want to uh, tell the audience first? Oh, sorry, Doctor, you're muted. Right, no, carry on. Okay, sure. Let's move on to the case. So here we have us uh, with us today is uh, Mr. Tia Lees, a 67-year-old Chinese gentleman who presented to the surgery clinic with a history of fresh parietal bleeding for the past three days. So regarding the bleeding, it was uh, painless and it was fresh uh, bleeding and uh, it's moderate in amount staining the whole square drap of which the patient had at home. He had to change the depth drop for two to three times daily for the past three days. Amount was consistent throughout the three days and it was not mixed with fecal content during passage of ocean. So only up to one day ago, the amount of bleeding is reduced and mixed with mucus along with small amount of fecal content. Moving on, along with the bleeding, there's also a uh, tenacious and feeling of incomplete passage of motion, which has been intermittent. However, there is no mass felt at the inner region upon wiping, and there's no constipation or outer bowel habits from his usual bowel opening of once every one to two days. Aside from the fresh painless bleeding, uh, parietal bleeding, he is also experiencing um, localized uh, right iliac fossa pain. Occasionally, he's uh, unable to give the exact timeline for, for that pain which is described as sharp in nature and is exacerbated by lying on his right and only relieved by rest and occasionally uh, some positional change, which he can't tell which position will make you feel better as well. He just try it out. And there is no abdominal distension and there is no inability to pass flatus and bowel openings as mentioned are normal. So Aside from the um, per-rectal bleeding and also the right iliac fossa pain, there is also left lower back pain, which is again intermittent and sharp in nature that radiates to the left gluteal region. It is exacerbated by movement and relieved by acupuncture. Uh, the pain score was from 8 to 9 out of 10, which reduced to 2, to 2 out of 10, and eventually 0 out of 10 after the acupuncture. Uh, the pain is affecting his daily living and he will limp due to the pain upon walking. There is also fatigue and posterior dizziness. However, there is no uh, pallor or any history of syncope, which is suggestive of um, some anemic symptoms due to the painless parietal bleeding. And there is no fever, no unintentional loss of weight, no loss of appetite and no night sweats, no groin swelling as well, no joint dis, no short loss of breath, no history of hematemesis, nor epigastric pain of any previous upper GI diagnosis. So upon further history, this is actually not his first episode of fresh painless parietal bleeding. 
his first episode was four years ago in December 2017, where he was initially admitted for a cardiac event. And uh, he was being served blood thinner, which he cannot remember the name, and it stained the blood sheet, bed sheet with fresh blood from the uh, from from the it's from of uh, rectal origin overnight. He was then sent to BPUM for investigation and management of Prof Kong. And colonoscopy was done and reviewed a mass, and a HPE reviewed uh, HPE was being done and reviewed adenocarcinoma along with imaging. Uh, which was done, which is uh, MRI and CTTAP for staging, and clinically it was staged at stage three. It was then planned for preoperative radiotherapy, uh, but chemotherapy was not done uh, due to recent myocardial infarction. So again, moving on, on July 2018, open ultra low anterior resection with covering ileostomy was done in PPUM. And he then completed uh, adjuvant chemotherapy, which is uh, 12 cycles of Fort Fox on March 2019. During the chemotherapy, he did experience some side effects, which is nausea, vomiting, hair loss, fatigue, and weakness, which is quite common for, for this regimen. Covering ileostomy was again reversed one year later in August 2019, what, but was complicated with persistent diarrhea. Um, CT scan then reviewed a pre cycle collection and he was planned for city guided drainage to January 2020. And uh, moving on, he was well after the drainage, but has been on constant follow up under colorectal surgery and oncology in PPUM. Um, he was asymptomatic and well ever since the image guided drainage, which his baseline CA reading hovering around 1.2 to 2.4 to 2.4. However, uh, on last December, which is December 2021, there's a spike in CA reading up to 12.6, and a colonoscopy was planned and done uh, during this February 2022, and a 9cm tumour was discovered. So, uh, odd enough, uh, there's no active plans being discussed with the patient after the colonoscopy. And on May 2022, which is three months later, he experienced fever along with right elect for pain for seven days, which was uh, not re relieved with paracetamol. He then went to emergency department where he was discharged after completing a course of antibiotics IV and with a diagnosis of adhesion colic. He then recurred on the same month and only energy I was giving during this visit uh, to the emergency department. OK, so he then move on to Glenn Eagles to seek for second opinion regarding his uh, malignancy, which is discovered with uh, the colonoscopy in February 2022. And a CT urogram was done, which revealed a 9.5 cm tumor impacting on the surrounding structure. And he was then again referred to Prof Kong for further investigations and intervention. PET scan was done and does not reveal any distant metastasis, and biopsy was done after the PET scan uh, via colonoscopy, but um, to and confirm the diagnosis of recurrent adenocarcinoma. MRI was done in Glen Eagles and planned for MDT discussion for the management. And uh, he was then planned for eight cycles of neoadjuvant chemotherapy, and he completed that with side effects of nausea, vomiting, shivering, hair loss, and tingling on fingertips and toe tips. Huh? Um, surgical intervention was also planned for him, but the tumor removal will be incomplete uh, due to the location of the tumor being too close to the sacrum. So he did express that he wished to be tumor free, so he would want to seek second opinion regarding the surgery. Uh, yeah. Moving on, yeah, there's a very, very extensive history for the patient. I'm moving on to the past medical history. So it's underlying hypertension, which is diagnosed 25 years ago on amlodipine, 5 milligram per oral. And uh, BP was quite uh, stable, hovering around 110, 120 for his systolic dyslipidemia on azantimib, uh, following up on Glen Eagles, and uh, was kept in check as well. And ischemic heart disease, currently on metropolon aspirin. So uh, here's a history of COVID category one confirmed positive in January 2022, was uh, isolated in Sungai Buloh Hospital due to his multiple comorbids and was uh, well after that, just uh, an episode of thrombophlebitis during the stay. 
So other than that, he has completed all his three doses of COVID-19 vaccination. And not on any traditional medication, not on food or medication, and uh, not on food allergies, but there is uh, pruritis over the over the neck, uh, face and neck during uh, the, the CABG, during contrast use uh, for, for, for planning of CABG, like some typo there. And was immediately uh, resolved after prednisolone administration. So, like mentioned prior, um, there is uh, past surgical history. There is history of coronary artery bypass grafting performed in 2009 in Prince Court Medical Center. So it was uneventful. Uh, yeah. And there is no malignancy history in the family. Moving on to the family history. Four siblings do have um, coronary artery disease, including a patient, which suggests very strong family history of uh, CAD. And he was married and blessed with three daughters who are all healthy, except the second daughter with some gynecological issue, which is adenomyosis and is currently under treatment. No history of polyps in the family, and father passed away at the age of 72 due to a non medical condition, and mother passed at the age of 84 with old age. So again, for the social history, he's a non-smoker and a social drinker, which last drank in February 2022, and a retired executive at Petronas. Um, financially, he was doing quite well. He's affordable, and uh, he was quite active with all the daily morning walks. Uh. So his diet was quite uh, suggestive, uh, as it is quite high. Uh, it's highly fatty and low fiber in content, along with his high consumption of red meat before the uh, for active bleeding in the 2017. And he switched to high fiber and low fat diet after the diagnosis of um, uh, rectal adenocarcinoma previously in 2017. So that concludes the history itself. So anything that a uh, doctor would like to add on or highlight for the history in cases, especially per rectal bleeding. That's fine. Do you do you have any images? Images uh, later in the uh, for investigation. Yes, we do have some. OK, so it's a very long history. Yeah. And um, his presentation now is the same as his presentation in the past. Yeah, I don't mean by square sheet. Sorry. Square sheet. It is soaking the square sheets. What are those? Oh no, it's just like a drape which he has at home. I, I don't know for what reason as well. He just drape it under his underwear and then when he first noticed the bleeding. So is that like a pad or a bed sheet? That I, I'm not sure. I did not clarify further. Okay. So a bit about PR bleeding or any bleeding, you need to quantify. Okay. okay. So to quantify bleeding, um, they can describe a cup full, a toilet bowl full, a floor full, a pail full, a cup, teaspoon, tablespoon on the tissue in the toilet, you need to quantify. And of course, the measurements by the patient will be inconsistent. A picture is good. But what is important in bleeding is you want to know whether they go into hemodynamic shock. Especially if someone got a ischemic heart disease. Okay. They might tolerate a low blood count. They might not tolerate an acute blood count. Okay. Mm. So most importantly in bleeding, you mentioned the duration, you mentioned the amount, but the amount doesn't specify the significance. So if you've mentioned square sheets, either it's it's on I'm we're not all not all not clear about what is a square sheet, but if you okay. mention a gauze or a gum G, then that is quantifiable bleeding. Okay, like you see in OT. Um if they mention toilet bowl is Full of blood that is red 
also is not good because a drop of blood can make the entire toilet bowl red. Similarly, clots and multiple liters of bleeding can also give you a toilet bowl that is red. So toilet bowl in a drop of blood in water versus many drops of blood doesn't also quantify. All right. So what is the thing that you do to ask? I mean, what is what would you ask the patient? Whether mm. it's heavy bleeding. Symptoms for anemia just to screen through quickly. Yes. Symptoms of anemia is chronic bleeding where they are suddenly just very tired and fatigued. Okay, over a period of time, that's chronic anemia. But symptoms of acute bleeding is syncope. Oh. All right. So now, what will happen if I uh, stab you? All right, in the aorta, you will collapse. Your HB yep. will stop three. Okay. And um, what if somebody is walking around with a HB of three, who's been having hemorrhoidal bleeding every day? And then suddenly now they feel like they're a little bit too tired and looks too pale, right? So they can walk around, but someone who's stabbed will die, right? Mm -hmm. Because of the acute blood loss. So that is the body's mechanism of coping, all right? So what well, you need to ask, in the PR bleeding, do you have syncope? Which means that it's a significant and acute blood loss there and then. So that will tell you the significance of the bleeding. It will give you a clue to what kind of bleed this is. So the most common cause of PR bleed, as you know, is what now? Most common. Most common would be... Hemorrhoids. Oh, yeah. Most common is hemorrhoids. Painless PR bleeding is hemorrhoids. Okay? The most, um, the most significant PR bleed, what would that be? Significant, significant as it will cause mm -hmm. syncope, it will be a lot, patient will be worried, there's more and more of it. It's diverticular bleed. Okay? The most important PR bleed that you cannot miss is rectal tumor or anal cell okay. carcinoma. That you cannot miss this. You must exclude this in all the bleeding complaints. Mm. All right? And then you have the others, angiodysplasia, you have the others. Um, inflammatory bowel disease. So that ties in with other interesting history. Okay, but in terms of PR bleed, uh, you must know the amount, the significance, and tell us what is the reason that they are bleeding. That when you bleed, you should clot. If you don't clot, there is a reason for it. Either the bleeding is too fast, such as in a very very rapid uh, upper GI bleed from very soon. Okay. So the upper GI bleed is bleeding too fast. Yeah. In varices, the there are no clotting factors because the less deranged liver functions, and you have in history to back that up. Okay, right? Mm. Okay, and in um, why else would you not um, stop bleeding? It's a very fast bleed, are arterial bleeds, which is the case for diverticular disease. They are arterial bleeds. As you know, diverticular disease is formed by the weakness in the muscles yep. of the musculus propria, and the weakness is caused by an artery that punctures through to, to supply the mucosa of the bowel. And so, when there is a bleed from the diverticulum, the bleeding is coming from this artery. So, this is arterial bleed. That's why it's significant. Okay. And number three, why would they not stop bleeding? Usually, they are on anticoagulants. Okay. They are on aspirin, they could be on warfarin, they could be on apixaban, factor 10 inhibitors, many things, right? So that's your second important question about bleeding. And of course, in somebody who's you already established having syncope and going into hemodynamic instability, look at the medication in terms of what they take, whether or not they are non hypertensive, okay, who are on antihypertensive, mm. which means that they will drop their blood pressure really quickly. And you don't want to compound that drop with your antihypertensives, yeah. And at the same time, with their medications, you must look at the whether or not they're taking any beta blockers that could mask that could mask the tachycardia. So if oh. some beta blockers, they will not manifest tachycardia because the heart rate is controlled by the medication. So the classic hemodynamic response would be. Drop in blood, drop in HB, drop in BP, tachycardia. Because your body is trying to maintain the BP. 
So it will have a reflex tachycardia, but because they're on beta blockers, their heart rate will be normal. Okay. Now, the last part about bleeding and any other, you can apply this for any bleeding history, all right, is what now? Any idea? Okay. <laughs> last part history is um, you must find the location. Where so you must localize it, and if you have this blood coming from per rectal, it's definitely a GI bleed. You must localize whether it's upper or lower, okay. And most of the lower GI bleed can also be from an upper. The only differentiating um, a part about upper and lower is the where is the source. So if the source is above the ligament of tree, it's upper. If it's lower than that, it's lower GI bleed. Okay, distal to the ligament of tri, it's lower GI bleed. Okay, but in upper, in lower GI bleed, you got the most common is a um, hemorrhoid. The most rampant is cervicular bleed, and you have the most important not to miss is tumor, and then the rest, angiodysplasia and other things. Okay, so once you have the history, you know actually which one is the patient having and in this patient you know that he has tumor in the past and he had already a colonoscopy that shows a tumor back in february and then this now has bled and he has symptoms that says that the tumor is locally advanced it is moving towards his left nerve sacral nerve roots causing a left sided pain on the leg uh, it is also causing intermittent small bowel obstruction or adhesional obstruction where the small bowel has attached itself to the tumor in the pelvis. Okay. So, what else about this patient uh, that is interesting is that he has had a surgery for the for the operation. I mean, uh, uh, for the tumor in the beginning. However, he was in a state where he could not have the full treatment. If you see. In the beginning of time, where he was presenting with the symptoms, he recently had heart issues, whereby he could not have the chemotherapy portion of the new adjuvant. So he only, he only had radiotherapy. And I missed out, maybe you can tell us, Owen, whether he had any post-operative chemotherapy? Uh, post-operative... Uh... Not that I recall. So, yeah, not that I recall. Go back one more slide. Yeah, so he had a complication after surgery whereby there is a pre sacral collection. Okay, so that collection could uh, stop you from having chemotherapy because you don't want to have chemo with the active ongoing abscess formation. All right, you become immunosuppressed and you can die from sepsis. So you don't want to give chemotherapy for this reason. But he never had chemotherapy initially for his heart. And then now the pre sacral collection is post-operatively. But you should still have chemotherapy because this is stage 3. Can you go to the slide? Uh, uh, sorry, doctor. Uh, my bad. After, it, it, there is adjuvant chemotherapy, the 12 cycles of Fox. So and then, yeah, Fox. there is. Okay. Right, so now why do you have a pre sacral collection? Hmm? This is interesting. Why would you have a pre sacral collection? Most three probably years, three years sorry. after your operation. <laughs> uh, maybe some. Okay, so uh, the logical explanation here is that he had a covering ileostomy. For which prior to that he did, there's nothing going through the anastomosis, right? Mm. But before we close the ileostomy, we would have definitely tested it with colonoscopy and a, a loop ileos, a loop program, a loop program, a distal loop program mm. that would not shown any leak. That's why we did this. But uh, yes, so what's interesting is probably it was not a leak that it was actually this pre collection is tumor. Can you go one one slide back, one slide forward? Uh, 
So since 2020, since this this query collection, query recurrence, it never really got better. Mm. It's just like a while and then a few months that he, he see a spike back. Yeah. Mm. Okay. All right, so, so we've talked about PR bleeding, we've talked about um, uh, reasons for tumor recurrence. One, you did not receive complete therapy. Two, you have a collection that is unexplained because usually collection happens mm. after. And then three, you have a rising CEA level. Okay. And um, if you look at his uh, colono his follow up, right, is, is his colonoscopy one year after his surgery? Did he already have? He should, but in terms of follow up, we need to make sure that there has to be no lapse in our follow up. So one year after colonoscopy, uh, one year after surgery, they need to have colonoscopy. They need to have three monthly CEAs. And because it's stage three and they have had chemotherapy, they need to have yearly CT scans. And for this man, he actually did. Okay. And the problem about yearly CT scans is if, if you had a report, from a radiologist before to say that there is a presexual mass uh, or lesion or collection in an air, in and around the anastomosis, what we can do is biopsy this, PET scan this, or follow this up in another CT scan one year down the line because we are also then um, looking at CEA and to see whether or not the CEA goes up together with this image. So if there is a collection or some sort of suspicious lesion around the tumor, around the anastomosis, that's not explained. We need to make sure that it's not a recurrent. So the way that this has been explained is that his CEA was not rising in trend and that, that, that collection or mass or scarring, they will say fibrosis, hasn't increased in size. Okay? That was the time, um, that was how it was just watched from 2019 to 2022. Okay. And what's interesting, you must also ask, um, what is his baseline CEA before surgery? Before the okay. first, do you have that? Uh, not before surgery, it's only after where it's hovering around. Yeah. So sometimes some tumors don't elevate the CEA. So you can have a CEA of one pre-op. So pull up if your CEA is two, that is alarming. Although your CEA, if it's more than five, usually that's the baseline for causing alarm. In UM, the cutoff mark is 2.5. In most of the centers, yeah. five. Okay. So if your baseline CEA is not raised, even a slight raise from your baseline is a concern. If your baseline CEA is at 18 and it goes down to zero and it comes back to one, two, that's okay. But then if your baseline is 1 and it goes down to 0 or less than 0 0.5, usually they will say it, and then it comes back up to 1, there is a reason for concern. Or if it comes back up to 2, even though it's not more than 2.5, it's not more than 5. So those you'd be worried about, you would check. Okay? Interesting. The next problem with him also, he had COVID. Cat one, not much could be done within that four months that he's recovering. Okay, let's go ahead and see the rest of the investigation. So far, any questions? Uh, so far, not from the audience. Me myself. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it's it's quite quite. Ex the doctor, not your explanation is quite extensive. A lot of things I didn't think when I was taking the history. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So. I to make the comments about um, you must you must uh, categorize this this mm. complaint. You must have a plan. At the end of what you say, I need to have a plan. I don't need to still wonder what's going on, what's going on. No, mm. I need to have a plan by the end of your first line. All right. So then I will know. Okay, at least I need to give urgent attention. All right. What's going on? Okay. Interesting. Next one. So so how to categorize that is you determine whether they are in hemodynamic shock. So especially when you start working in recess in ED, then you have to, to have two large bulb granulars, you got to put, put their oxygen on, you have to get the blood in, cross match, you got to stop the antihypertensive, stop the aspirin, you know, and then start thinking about doing an upper scope, lower scope, or a CT angiogram. Okay. So you got to be fast at that point. 
apnea. So uh, when anybody mentioned bleeding, if you present it to your boss, bleeding, blah, 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 bleeding, bleeding, and then they look at the history, oh, a patient is on warfarin, or patient on aspirin, patient has AF, then you are screwed. Because you haven't done the necessary to stop the ongoing problem. Okay. Next one. Okay. Just um, very quickly move through the physical examination. So it's a well-built Chinese gentleman not attached to any medical equipments. Alert, conscious, and breathing comfortably under room air with his vital signs of um, one four, uh, BP being 142 over 69 millimeters mercury. Um, pulse rate of 78, regularly regular with good volume and a respiratory rate of 16 breaths per minute, SPO2 98% of room air and his air vibram. Uh, yeah, and moving on, uh, his CRT is less than two seconds with womb peripheries. There's no finger clubbing, no palma pelor, no conjunctiva pelor, and no scleroid icterus. He's well hydrated. He has a well hydrated oral mucosa with a well healed scar over the sternal area and also the right anterior medial calf, suggestive of his previous history of coronary artery bypass grafting. And this is just a picture of the scar, very well healed over the sternal region. And um, so the abdomen itself, when we uh, inspected, is not distended and umbilicus is not uh, inverted or inverted, it's not displaced as well. And well healed laparotomy scar visible with a well healed transverse scar as well over the right iliac fossa region, which corresponds to the history of the covering ileostomy that was reversed. And abdomen is soft and non tender with uh, non palpable liver and spleen. Kidneys are not balotable and negative shifting downness, active bowel sounds heard over uh, auscultation and cough reflex is negative. No inguinal lymph nodes felt and correctly there's no mass uh, visible over the anus and he has an empty rectum when we uh, perform the DRE. It's just a picture of his abdomen, there's a midline, uh, you can see a midline scar that's quite well healed and also a right uh, iliac fossa scar corresponding to the to the uh, covering iliostomy. Okay, um, moving on. That that's a very quick PE and a summary. So Mr. Tia a 67 year old Chinese gentleman who underwent neoadjuvant chemotherapy and ultra low anterior resection, uh, along with covering iliostomy for stage three rectal cancer five years ago, with underlying hypertension, dyslipidemia, and coronary artery disease as well presented to the surg surgery clinic with fresh painless per bleeding for the past three days. There is also tenesmus along with fatigue. Um, during examination, the abdomen is soft and non-tender and no mass was felt. So I would like to also add in the summary that he's currently on aspirin 100 milligram um, uh, 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 OD as well, just to put that in. Mm -hmm. So yeah, regarding the PE, it's, it's quite Okay, uh, anything to add on, Dr. Noah? Uh, no, that's a good summary. But and, uh, uh, if sorry. you look at the summary again, uh, yeah. your summary should be the presenting complaint on the first line. Oh, okay, sorry. Not the so, so your summary should be what he has, why you think he has it and what we're doing about it. Okay. Okay. So you can say what he has is PR bleeding on a background of rectal tumor, suspicious for recurrence since February 2022 with race CEA and under investigation. Or plan for palliative surgery or plan for palliative chemotherapy or plan for second opinion. You must have a what we're going to do about it. If you don't have what we're going to do about it, that means you haven't processed the case. And then to, to me, for me to solve the problem. You should always appear to have tried to solve the problem yourself because that's your learning. Okay. And it's going to take over me. All right? Okay. okay. Moving on to the provisional diagnosis. So it is, uh, my provisional diagnosis is uh, recurrent rectal carcinoma due to the history of uh, rectal carcinoma itself 
uh, five years ago and also painless per rectal bleeding in an elderly man. And uh, in the history, there is also intermittent tenesmus with lower back pain due to proximity of mass location over the sacral region. Uh, um, there is also uh, constitution, constitutional symptoms such as fatigue and possibly anemic symptoms as well as posterior dizziness, which we discovered uh, in the history itself. Yeah. OK. Moving on. OK, moving on with the differential diagnosis. Um, first being diverticular bleeding, uh, which uh, the points towards is that there is painless, fresh, proactive bleeding with history of out of bowel habits. And it's an elderly man. And um, the point away is, uh, of course, first thing we need to think of is colorectal carcinoma because he has a history of. And there is no previous colonoscopy or imaging report regarding uh, diverticulosis as well. And, and, yeah. uh, and uh, the second differential diagnosis will be internal hemorrhoid due to the points towards being the painless fresh parietal bleeding along with no mass felt over the, the anal region. Uh, but again, the point away will be his history of uh, colorectal carcinoma and uh, there's no mass felt even upon the DRE and with the constitutional symptoms along with the abdominal pain, which is not really suggestive of internal hemorrhoid itself. Okay. Yeah. And another differential diagnosis and another to rule out itself is torrential upper, upper GI bleeding, which Dr. Nora mentioned previously. Um, uh, any torrential bleeding of upper GI origin, be it varices or any 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 other causes, need to be ruled out during investigations. Uh. But the points are where is uh, the symptoms are predominantly lower GI origin with the outer bowel habits itself, and also again history of colorectal carcinoma. And um, last but not least, coagulopathy. Since he is on antiplatelet, which is aspirin, 100 milligram OD, and then uh, is an elderly man with a heart issue, so we need to rule this out via investigation itself. Um, and uh, coagulopathy, of course, the point away is that the presence of lower GI symptoms, which is with the tenesmus, uh, suggests that there is a possibility of a mass in there. So yeah, I still need to rule out. So, yeah. Okay. Um, and your coagular party as well is driven by aspirin. Yeah, patients got platelet dysfunction mm. on aspirin. Okay. So that makes the bleeding a lot more brisk and more difficult to control. And as you know, most of your causes here, all of them are self limiting. 80% of the ventricular bleed stopped by itself. Internal hemorrhoid stops once the bleed, the blood is empty, all right, in that hemorrhoid. Torrential upper GI bleed will not stop unless you stop it, either a peptic ulcer disease that will naturally coagulate uh, if you've given them PPI, all right, uh, and decrease the acid, or you can give the, for very severe bleeding, you can give them vasopressors. But uh, for torrential uh, for coagulopathy, you must make sure you have reversed the aspirin or stop the aspirin at least. Okay, and if those who are not contraindicated, so the contraindication uh, for this medicine is ischemic heart disease. So, so for in this patient, it is contraindicated. But for those without that history, you can have tranexamic acid that could help stop bleeding. Okay, whatever the cause. All right. Right. Going on, so uh, investigations are divided into two parts. Uh, the ones that I would like to 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 perform in for this patient, and also later we will have a look at the results. Uh. So first of all, again the baseline, the basic tree, uh, complete blood count with differential count, just to determine the presence of anemia and its type itself via the MCV and MCH, due to uh, presence of uh, blood loss and chronic disease itself. So we also just want to quickly route infection if there is any leukocytosis, which might suggest infection. And the differential count, of course, will, will, will signify the etiology of the infection itself, if present. And again, a very, very important thing here, the platelet count, just to route coagulopathy as it's on aspirin itself. A liver profile as a baseline of further management and also to evaluate his nutritional status which he is, uh, because he's a cancer patient, so nutritional status is very important. And renal profile, this is a baseline for investigation and also presence of any AKI due to blood loss and also prolonged aspirin use. Mm -hmm. 
Um, yeah, and then coagulation profile, just to rule out whether there's any underlying coagulopathy. Group screen and hold, just hold it just in case we need it. Lah. Iron studies uh, to, to, to determine the presence of iron deficiency anemia due to recent blood loss. And a serum CA to evaluate the trend itself to determine presence of relapse. Yeah. Okay. So imaging, just scoping, uh, colonoscopy. So, uh, of course, just to visualize the mass itself if you can, and to obtain for samples for HPE, which he has done, and CT tap, and also pelvic MRI, just to stage the tumor locally and also whether there's any distant mats along PET scan. So, this is the result for the full blood count. So HP is 137, which uh, he doesn't have any underlying anemia. Other than that, platelet is 181, which is in, within normal range. Of course, it would be best if you have a baseline to compare, which, yeah, that, that was my mistake. Huh? <laughs> yeah. And differential count is normal as well. Moving on to the renal profile, uh, uh, not significant aside from EGFR 87, which is just, just slightly lower for his age, it's actually quite okay. And moving on to liver profile, everything's okay. Albumin, albumin is 39, which is that does not suggest of any nutritional deficiency. Um, yeah, and uh, moving on to coagulation profile, PT is slightly um, uh, low, just borderline, it's 10.2, uh, and then FPTT is, uh, yeah, it's low as well. So be quite, yeah. I don't know whether. Not to say low, it's borderline as well. Lah. And iron studies itself is quite significant. The serum iron being extremely low, 4.1. Can be two reasons uh, from what I can think of. Can be because of the bleed and can be because of the underlying malignancy itself. So I need to supplement in, in, one, in our management. Okay. All right. Good. Moving on, anemic workup. They also did an anemic workup. Serum folate, B12, transferrin, and TIBC is all normal. Just TRF saturation is slightly low, which corresponds to the iron deficiency itself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the CA trend since 2020. So we can see uh, like it's quite okay. And then suddenly there's a spike here in, in December 2021 and just consistently increasing throughout. And moving on, so to the scope, colonoscopy, the most recent one, which is in 6th of July, uh, scope until up to cecum, and there's multiple sessile polyps over the rectum and transverse colon. And uh, narrow lumen, uh, which is 5 cm from the anal verge, and no intraluminal mass seen, so which is quite um, worrying because it can be extra luminal itself. Uh, uh, it's there is edematous mucosa, most likely like what what uh, was mentioned, ex external compression from presacrum, so called mass. Uh. So pelvic MRI, he did it on at Prince Scott Medical Center at thirtieth of June. There is uh the impression straight away said is a rectal carcinoma recurrence, which from his clinical history is quite suggestive lah. A pre with minimal infiltration into S1 and S2 anterior vertebral body, which is causing his gluteal pain, and also Dr. Nora mentioned just now as well. Um, and also, there is fibrotic encasement of left internal iliac artery, which uh, I would say is quite uh, significant for further man for management later. However, there is no significant leaf not metastasis or other significant bony lesions. Yeah. So just a quick look at the picture itself. Uh, the uh, you can see a uh, switch pointer. So there's a mass we can see here, and a lot of sort of like inflammatory changes with very hazy la. And there is a the pre mass that was mentioned in the report itself. Um, yeah, and moving on to the CTTAP. Uh, there is a, again a pre circular collection of soft tissue lesion, but there is no evidence of distant mats. And there is resolved past COVID 19 pneumonia, which is from, from his history itself in 2021. Okay, so from the CT tab, you can see that there is a mass here. So zoom in. That's the mass right there in the pre circular region. Um, 
and also in another view, which we can see there's a the, the, the mass there. But of course, uh, patency can be seen from colonoscopy itself. Uh, in on so PET CT, there is um, current PET CT just shows an active pre-sacral recurrence. So there's no distal mass and CT guided biopsy was done and the result is still pending now because it was done quite recently. So this is a PET image. Um, so CT PET, uh, a PET CT, so there's no distal mass shown aside from the sacral, sacral lesion. Just uh, zoom in and another view. So yeah, uh, so that's it for investigation. Um, is there anything that I don't know I want to add for the investigation itself? Okay, so a lesson to be learned in this case is that once you have a lesion, you got to follow it up. Yeah. You need to know what it is. You need to do your triple assessment. If you can't examine it, you must try to see it. You must try to see it with a scope. If it's not mm -hmm. a visible on scope, you must try to see it on MRI or any fancier scans. And see. You want to try to make sure that it is not a tumor. That's what you need to do. The problem with PET scan is that it can light up if it is also infective. All right, so PET scan may or may not give you the answer, but if it lights up, you must rule out infection, you must rule out tumor. So biopsy is best. And in this case, there are no lesions to be biopsy through the scope. So this has to be done by the radiologist. The interventional radiologist will have to biopsy this lesion. It cannot be reached with the scope. There's no way that we can poke through and through the mucosa of the rectum mm. to get at the sacral region. Okay, so I I think the patient has the result already. It's adenocarcinoma. Oh. So the lesson to be learned is when if you don't have a histology, uh, you follow the CEA, but you must try to get histology no matter what. A PET scan will not tell you exactly. Only HPE does. Okay, and once you have a diagnosis of a recurrence, think about why why it could be recurrence. Number one, there is a suspicious lesion that isn't going away. All right, if it's a scar, it will fibrous and go away. If it's an infection, it will um, become a, a scar after it has dried up, and then that will go away. If it is a tumor, it will keep growing. All right, or it is persistently there, or it gets bigger, or it starts invading other structures. In this case, it already has post bilateral, if not unilateral, hydronephrosis, which means it has affected the ureter. And it has also encroached upon the nerve root of S1 on the left side, as you can see here on the left. Okay, so if it's a tumor, it is growing. Okay, you must not think that this is an infection if it's growing. Infection doesn't last years, okay? Mm. And you must um, you must have a high index of suspicion. And the other the other thing that points towards tumor recurrence is the fact that he had a leak or pre-leak immediately after the reversal of the ileostomy. Uh, hard to say. There may have already been seedlings of tumor in the presacral space. Okay, like we microscopic tumor in that pre space already, and over time became a scar. And for some reason, now so many years after the chemotherapy, it then developed into its own growth. So that's why you don't see it on colonoscopy. That's why it's all outside of the colon, and that's where you have this massive lesion here in the pre space. Okay, unfortunately, not much can be done because it is not. Resectable. You will not get any benefit in survival in doing a half job. In fact, you would increase their morbidity and enhance their mortality. Because once you put yourself under the knife, your immunity goes down. Your immunity is what will keep you from having distant metastases. Your immunity guards against. Um, cancer cells developing in other places, even this, this local disease here, your immunity will keep it at bay, keep it small, keep it as to its size. The moment you start cutting up the patient, the immunity will then change to 
making the wound clean, not making the wound infected, right? So this cancer has a chance to grow and spread while your immunity is focused on something else. Okay? And if so, you did cut this tumor out and leave behind traces of it, that too will progress. So doing um, extended resection or what we call pelvic exenteration, when you don't receive or where you don't get R0, you don't get clear margin, you are doing the patient more harm. But of course, people can attempt and you can see the result of the attempts where there's no benefit. Okay? So, um, points to take home. Whatever you see, don't move from it until you've sorted it out. So, even your simple history, whatever you say in your history, don't move for it until I know that you have a plan and that you have thought about it. It's safe to move on. You have processed it. It's safe to move on. Okay, if you, even if you don't know whether it's safe to move on or not, you can give it a test of time and you can watch it. But you must watch it. Now, his problem was after the colonoscopy in February 2022, I guess, where they found a lesion at 9 centimeters, nobody saw or did anything about that polyp. We don't have HPE. We don't have any imaging, right? So everything has to be assessed. You either get you get histobiology, you actually get the tissue, you look at it with scans, and you feel it. You try to feel it with your fingers. If you can't feel it with your fingers, then you feel it with the scope. Feel how it feels. What is it? You know, you need to have a diagnosis whether it's safe to live alone, you want to watch it, or you want to take it out. Okay. okay. Next one. Oh, so, sorry, Doctor. Before that, just a quick question. So he had an elastomatic leak post reversal. Uh, I know that it's one of the complications for reversal, but can that anastomatic leak be caused by the so and so? They said the collection. Maybe it, it is a tumor growing that is causing the anastomatic leak itself due to poor healing. Okay, so when you have a closure of stoma, you really just want to close back your loop iliostomy, right? Yep. When you finally close your iliostomy and poop starting come out, starting to come through the your rectal anastomosis, right? Yeah. When you have enough pressure to generate a a big bowel motion, that pressure may not match uh, what you've tested. Okay, so you've tested the anastomosis with a colonoscopy, make sure that there is no leaking. All right, you tested it with a loop program. Make sure there's no leaking of contrast, okay? But those are no match for actual poop coming out, all right? So there may be small, small openings in the anastomosis or like a pathway around the anastomosis that after there is a closure of stoma, there is a collection, see? There should be a collection two years down the line. And if it was a collection, you have to see whether or not there is a leak. Mm. If there's a leak, where the tumor was, okay, the, the tumor hasn't been there for the last two years, but yeah. now there, right, there could be cells in and around the area of leak that harbor tumor, and that, that has progressed. It could be, it could be a cell that's all along in the pre-sacral space that just decides to progress because there's no more chemo agent on has been hopping on it, all right? So it's trying to grow, okay? There could be a lot of different, or they could be, you know, you know, when I say, if you have surgery, your immunity drops, that could be the chance that your stomach, when he had the closure of iliostomy, that could have been the chance where the tumor decides to grow, right? And not only was there just a closure of iliostomy, there was also a period of pre collection that required drainage and antibiotics. That also drops your immunity. So wherever the tumor was or whatever the tumor cells were doing in the past, now it has a chance to grow because patient is sick. Mm. Immunity is focused on other things. Get it? So this is uh this is all catalyst of of bad things. Alright, so surgery is not always a good thing. Uh, it has its side effects. Right? And this is definitely one of them. 
uh, although not directly, but indirectly, it, it may cause a recurrence. Okay. Unfortunately. Okay. But of course, everything is with good intention. Out of every hundred or uh, many stomas that we have closed for simple ultra low anterior section, none of them develop this. Okay. This is quite rare. So it's not uh, it's not a uh, everyday occurrence that this happens, but you can always explain it. Okay. Moving on. Uh, yeah. So my management is uh, is is after the the discussion prior. My management, I would like to just swap the whole thing now, because I was thinking of operating so. After the discussion just now, I yeah, I changed my mind. It's not gonna help. Um, so what I would love to do is just get the oncology on board and discussing regarding the new uh, just just radio, possibility of radiotherapy or chemotherapy itself. And uh get another a dietitian on board as well to discuss regarding the nutrition optimization, especially the iron aspect. And um yeah, uh others like the operative, post-operative, those are, I'm, I'm just going to cut it off. Lah. So, and after the the adjuvant chemotherapy or radiotherapy, um, like to follow up the patient itself, um, again, with a three monthly uh, CEA itself and a yearly CT tap and also colonoscopy, just to see how the tumor itself progress and also the healing. Okay. Yeah. So, yes, that's a good choice of, treatment options. Number one, if it's resectable, resect it. Okay. Mm. Number two, if it's not resectable, palliate it. So divert it or um, uh, facilitate uh, stomas or facilitate um, potential problems because if you cannot uh, remove it, you have to divert it so that patient don't obstruct from it. You don't want the patient to obstruct from it because you want the patient to go through palliative chemotherapy and you don't want intestinal obstruction during chemotherapy. So chemotherapy is another, I wouldn't say killer, but it's another damper to the situation where you can't operate someone on chemo. They will mm. not have wounds that can heal. So everything breaks down. Okay. Skin breaks down, anastomosis breaks down, small bowel tests break down, everything can become fistula, a patient can die from perforation. Yeah. Okay. So um you do you want to anticipate whether the patient may or may not obstruct from this recurrence. You want to do any intervention before you start your chemotherapy. The next one is radiotherapy. Usually oncologists will have a bit of a discussion why would they want to re-irradiate someone. And if they've already given a maximal dosage to that same area, they may not want to give another RT unless it's purely for palliative reasons. So in his case, you mentioned that a complaint is pre, uh, PR bleeding, but there is no source that could be identified on the colonoscopy. There is no lesion. Oh, there is. There is a lesion, right? So that, that lesion that is causing the patient to have PR bleed that can be irradiated as a last ditch effort to stop bleeding because if this is bleeding there's no way we can stop it unless we take it out or we stitch it close or what but now in this case radiotherapy is the option we want and that will be the last option no one in the right mind will want to go in and take it out <laughs> yeah. unless they are brave and they don't mind causing further problems Yeah, because when I was when I was going for the operative uh kind of kind of thinking, I I, I totally forgot that it's a it's well, first of all it's a recurrence and second of all it's a pre sacral region which is, and from the MRI we can say that there is encasement of internal iliac artery itself as well so it's very very, very risky. The internal iliac artery is not a problem. You can tie off the internal iliac artery. You can take off the sacral bone. It's no issue, but. That is if it's lower sacrum, beyond S3 level. So S3 level and beyond, you can take things off without without much consequence to life, all right? But above S3 level, they may not be able to walk. And 
intern eyelid arteries only supply the organs in your pelvis, the viscera is in your pelvis, the visceral artery, internal iliac artery is the main supplier. Now, without any of the internal organs there anymore, you can cut off both internal iliac arteries. The concern here is it has gone into the ureter and is encasing the common iliac, for which you have to reconstruct the common iliac. But the major concern that makes it unacceptable is the S1, S2 nerve root. So how are you going to shave tumor off nerve roots? And nerves, though it is there, and if you're touching one nerve, is the tumor abut the nerve, okay? The tumor tissue, <coughs> the tumor cell, will go into perineural invasion. It doesn't just invade the nerve at the point that it abuts. It invades the whole perineural system along the nerve sheath. It doesn't go into the nerve root. It goes along the nerve sheath. So that that then um, affects your margin. If you have a margin involved on the nerve sheath, then you could not have taken any more up the spine. And S1, S2 level, if you if in centers that do massive debulking, like you know, big sarcoma operations, that they would take out S1 and S2, you have to reconstruct. And you have to cut off the patient may not be able to walk. Mm -hmm. yep. And certainly there is not something in our center at the moment that we can do. So, yeah. So anything S3 and beyond, internal ILEX is okay. The limiting factor here is um, S1, S2 nerve root involvement, as well as uh, ureter and common ILEX. Okay. Mm. Uh, yeah, and that that for for the case itself, that's mostly it. And actually, just an uh, update a few days ago or last week, the MDT was was again they just uh they, the MDT result came out and then they did suggest for chemotherapy itself. But patient seems to be not too keen, so he wanted to seek second opinion now. Yeah. I think he can try to have his surgery in um, a center that has urology, vascular, orthopedics, yeah, and spine. If he does want all of it out, it's a major undertaking. Yeah. Don't think he is fit. Mm. So. Yeah, that, that's it for the case. So just quickly um, move on to screening colorectal carcinoma because it's quite commonly seen in elderly population itself. Um, so this is uh, something I got from the from the CPG 2017 uh, colorectal carcinoma Malaysian CPG. So you categorize it uh, uh, by a average risk, moderate risk, or high risk. So just quickly go through it. Um, you know, for the audience, you guys can read. And the, the highlight here is that um, CA is not for screening itself for colorectal carcinoma, from what I understand, but for monitoring and follow up. And it's best done in a trend, which later we'll talk about the following up the surveillance. And moving on to indications for genetic risk evaluation or assessment. So this is when things like um, Lynch syndrome, you have those in mind, uh, FFP or, or yeah, when you have those in mind, it's best if the center has it for genetic risk evaluation or assessment. And staging, so just to put it very briefly, you can have a clon uh, colonoscopy itself with direct visualization of the tumor along with HPE and CT tap and also MRI, pelvic MRI with contrast, you usually just see whether there's any nodal involvement and um, the, the involvement of the tumour with surrounding structures, like Dr. Nara mentioned prior, the common iliac artery, the ureter, and in this case, up to the sacrum, and also the nerve roots. And CT tap itself, just to see whether there is any, uh, uh, what do you call it, metastasis. Yeah, and also if the centre has it, uh, PET CT would be great as well. Um, Again, with uh, this is HPE data reporting, so it's it's not really that 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 uh, it's quite extensive, but it's not really yeah. I can just read through it. 
and staging itself with um from what I understand, uh, do correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, so usually if there's no nodal involvement, automatically it's stage three. But if uh, there is mats, of course it's stage four and stage one and two is where it gets a bit tricky because you need to see how extensive and how deep the tumor itself is. Just very briefly now. Yep. Of course there's three A, B, C itself. Uh, you can read, uh, the audience can read up the, 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 the CPG itself. And treatment itself, um, again, if it's quite localized, non nodal involvement, T1 or 2 can just go for, can push for surgery. Of course, depending on patient, whether the patient is fit or not. And um, T3, T4, and O, MO, which is uh, stage 2 to 3, if it's stage 2 surgery with adjuvant uh, CCRT, but if it's stage 3, the preferred option would be going, going for a new adjuvant CCRT then a surgery just to downstage a tumor if possible. But if there is any metastasis, so usually it's um, palliative and uh, supportive care itself, if there is tendency to obstruct, then maybe can go for tumor stenting or covering uh, stoma. Um, yeah, that's my understanding towards the treatment for colorectal carcinoma. Of course, there is, it's just very, very superficial. There's a lot of other factors to consider. Uh, which is differs from case to case. Um, yeah, regarding the treatment, anything else Dr. Noah to add on regarding the, the colorectal carcinoma treatment? You must understand that the treatment for colorectal um, is always surgery, but rectal, <clears throat> rectal will have the option of new adjuvant, okay? So rectal alone will need to have a local staging Colon will have normal staging as per anyone else, any other cancers, like CT, TAP is easy. Mm. But rectal, as long as it's mid and lower rectal, it needs to have a local staging with the MRI or end in ultrasound. So that will give you uh, the depth of invasion. So the depth of invasion is what that would determine whether you need to have radiotherapy or not. Any lymph node involvement, automatically radiotherapy first. Okay, any perirectal nodes that are involved around the tumor, definitely radiotherapy first or new adjuvant first. Uh, this is rectum, uh, rectum alone. Colon, any part of colon, go ahead for operation. Rectum, any nodes involved need to have radiotherapy first. Sometimes they give chemotherapy first because you want to have clear margin. In rectum, there are no space. There's no space left in your rectum. If you recur there, you are screwed. Like with this gentleman that we have, it's difficult to remove all the structures in the rectum, especially the sacral nerve roots. Okay, so rectum requires local staging, for which you want to get the best uh, um, down staging if possible, uh, or you need to get the mesorectum uh, clear and off tumor. You want to decrease the local recurrence and you want to increase the overall survival. In rectum, you give it adjuvant. In low to mid rectal tumors that have lymph nodes. Okay? Now, apart from lymph node, if your lymph node is zero, but if your tumor is T3 or T4, which is more than T1 and T2, okay? If your tumor is invading into the. If it's going into your muscles propria and going to the serosa, then you need to have new adjuvant radiotherapy. Okay, so <clears throat> now the the indication for new adjuvant radiotherapy in rectal tumor is mid and low rectal, any N positivity, any T3, T4, T1, T2. You can opt to do operation first because it's just you, you, are, you are secure about your margin because only in the mucosa, sub mucosa, it doesn't go beyond. But T3, T4, any end, low and mid, have to do new adjuvant therapy first. It says their preferred option is not, it is a definite option for us in UMNT and the rest of the world. Maybe some centers in Asia still don't have radiotherapy or MRI, then they can have this as preferred. Okay? But T3, T4 should. To do the patient's justice, they should have adjuvant therapy to determine, improve overall survival, and decrease local recurrence. Okay? Now, 
um, how about upper rectum? Yeah, I haven't mentioned upper rectum. I just said mid to low. Now, upper rectum or retosigmoid uh, is a choice. Okay? If it's upper rectum, if it's C3, then go ahead and do resection because upper rectum is behaves like colon. It is actually within the peritoneal cavity. Okay? So, upper rectum and retosigmoid behave like colon. If it's C3 or with any lymph node or whatever, it's going to have a lymph node in the mesentery that, that, that supplies it. Okay, it is not like a mesorectum that surrounds it, the mesentery that supplies it. That's the difference. So it's the mesorectum that requires this physiotherapy, not the upper rectum uh, or retrosigmoid mesentery, because you're taking out the mesentery anyway. Okay, and the mesentery, once it's removed, it's very far from the fruits. I mean, it's very far from the origin of the vessels that supply it. But the mesorectum is a network of vessels. That you think there are, they can be cells in that mesorectal fat, okay? Because that's a it's a network of blood supply. Mm -hmm. Whereas mesentery, if the cells were to escape the bowel, it would have to go up the the vessels and into the root of the IVC, or sorry, the SMV and the, uh, sorry the IMV and the IMA. So that's why you take the root of the IMV and IMA. So you take it very far from the tumor so that you ensure. The whole tumor package is oncological, it's resected with adequate margin. But for mesorectum, you need to irradiate it and you need to clear the mesorectal fascia. Okay? And if that is breach, there's another reason to continue your new adjuvant to try and make it make it smaller, make it uh, you say uh, make the margins free from tumor. Okay. All right. Um, yeah, moving on to the follow-up and surveillance itself. Um, so usually uh, post-treatment, uh, be it surgical or palliative. Um, again, history and PE is very important just to check up on the, on the patient, whether they are symptomatic or asymptomatic, and see air levels every three to six months for uh, consecutively five years, and also colonoscopy at year one. And... Uh, which is first year after the treatment and every three to five years thereafter. So CT's TAP, which is uh, Dr. Ma mentioned prior, uh, it's a yearly thing performed annually for the first three years. And for, of course, for high risk patient, it is reasonable to consider it every three, six to 12 months, which is every half a year to a year. So for the first three years. Yep. So, um, uh, Dr. Nora, if, j just a quick question regarding statement three. If it's high risk patient, imaging every six to 12 months, usually if it's high risk doctor, would you prefer six months or, or 12 months? If you are going to do this follow up with your oncologist. You've done your part as surgeon, you have removed the tumor. The oncologist needs to treat the systemic disease or what you think potentially there are microscopic cells that have escaped the tumor and it's now circulating, right? So after the end of your surgery, you have a stage three, you send the patient to oncologist for the chemotherapy. Why? Because at stage three, the lymph nodes are involved. Why? Because the lymph, once the lymph node is involved, you know that there are tumor cells in your lymphatic system yeah. that therapy, a systemic therapy. Okay? So when the chemotherapy starts, you want to see the progress of the chemotherapy and you want to monitor for any evidence of metastasis or deposits or recurrences. So this is where you play, have the role of doing a six-monthly um, uh, CT scan. Not because you are doing it to survey, but because you want to see the effect of the chemotherapy, usually. Mm. Okay? But reasonable is once a year for T3, and that is dictated by oncologists because they are the one giving the regime. Okay, So if you have your uh, first CT scan that is normal as a surgeon, your first CT scan after the one year after the chemotherapy done is normal, then you can repeat it again next year. You can repeat it again one more year and then finish. No more CT scan. If you repeat your CT scans too quickly also, there will not be any changes. And if you want to do the CT scan in six months, usually they will want to see the progress. Maybe there is already a lung mass or suspicious lung lesion that they need to monitor. They give chemotherapy. They want to see whether or not it has disappeared. So that's the six-monthly indication. Not all, and usually it's too, 
to check what chemotherapy agent works. If it has grown bigger, whatever lesion that they're monitoring has grown bigger, then they will change the regime of the chemo and then they repeat another scan after the cycle is complete. Okay, so on our part, at minimum, once a year for the first three years in, in uh, stage three tumor. Uh, yeah, that is mostly this reference at uh, 2017 uh, CBG for colorectal carcinoma. That is more, that is it for our session today. Before we quickly, uh, before we end the session, is there anything that Dr. Ra wants to wrap up for this case or any uh, parietal bleeding case in particular? Mm, not particularly, but you must remember the reason why we have such a high High incidence of stage three and stage four is because people are not aware of colorectal symptoms. Okay, so PR bleeding, PR bleeding is one of the symptoms. But usually, by the time you have the symptoms, you are already stage three, stage four. Okay, so we really need to advocate colonoscopic screening, which is to screen someone at risk before they have any symptoms. You know, they have the risk. So who are the, the risk above? 50 years old, uh, they have the risk, so they can screen themselves. Okay, um, if you if this gentleman had had a screening colonoscopy back in when he was 50, perhaps it would have been caught at T1, T2 level. Okay, usually when the symptoms come, and even if the patients know about the symptoms, when they have the symptoms, be stage three, stage four, usually. So that's what we're trying to look at to see whether the symptoms match the stage. It should. Uh, but we will see how true it is, and then we will target to advertise more on uh, awareness of the symptoms. Actually, only 40% of people know that PR bleeding is related to colon cancer, 40% out of 100%. But most of them, after they know about the PR bleed, they would not seek treatment. They will have a health belief to say that this is hemorrhoid. That's also to be educated. You, it, PR bleeding is two months. You otherwise proven it's not cancer. Hard to say, but um, but better than uh, having an unresectable disease like this. Okay. So, um, so here is the this is the end of our case. Uh. So, uh, we shall move on to the Q and A session. So for those who have any burning questions, please feel free to leave it in the chat or just uh, use the raise hand function and then just uh, ask directly voice out. Don't be shy, go ahead. This is quite an uh, um, important topic per se. Yeah. Oh, you think? Okay. okay. We'll give it some time. Yeah. So we'll give it some time. <laughs> Yeah, oh, there is someone. Let me just. Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, Mr. Gun. Just feel free to unmute yourself. Uh, doctor, does usually the chronic anemia will be, become a uh, acute anemia in this color of cases? Anemia, whether chronic or acute, can it be colorectal cancer? Is it? Uh, yes, doctor. Okay, so for anemia, means that it's usually asymptomatic that you don't actually see overt bleeding. Okay, overt means you actually see blood. If you don't see blood, you see black stools. If you don't see black stools, you see smelly stools or blood stained stools. All right, so that is called overt bleeding. So <clears throat> that is not exactly anemia. Anemia is when you still, when you feel um, fatigue, generalized fatigue, and you look pale, but you don't actually see any blood coming out of you. 
that means you've been bleeding intermittently in small amounts that are microscopic, too small for the stool to change color, too small for you to detect yourself, too small to look at the toilet bowl to see if it's red or not, but you're still bleeding. So this is usually the right-sided tumors, okay? These are usually tumors that are small enough that doesn't really obstruct, that doesn't really block the path of hard stool that will cause overt bleeding. Okay, so they're small bleeds. So these can be polyps, this can be right sided tumors, this can be um, uh, an angiodysplasia. But definitely, if you have anemia for any reason, anemia means you haven't seen any blood coming out of you, but you feel that you've lost weight. And you, I'm sorry, you feel that you've lost some blood and you are pale, all right, and you are tired, you get shortness of breath. So these are symptoms of anemia. Anemia is right-sided tumor or stomach cancer until proven otherwise. There's no other loss of blood <clears throat> apart from the GI tract. The only thing that comes out of you is, that, that, that can come out of you is your GI content. So usually you don't bleed from anywhere without realizing it, but you can bleed from your GI without realizing it because it's constant uh, it's intermittent. It may be small enough for you to detect. So the first thing anybody would do when someone is anemic is do the B12, iron studies, HB, and then they will ask for upper and lower scope. Because there could be small uh, sources of bleeding in the bowel or stomach that is causing the anemia. Okay? In your, when, when you say acute anemia, uh, not not quite such thing as acute anemia because anemia itself is a symptom. Um, you don't suddenly get pale. That's more like acute blood loss. Okay, so we'll, we'll say active PR bleed or acute blood loss. I don't really hear of acute anemia. Anemia is a very slow process. Okay, that's more chronic bleeding and that's from right sided tumor or stomach cancer. Whereas acute bleeding can occur from a dramatic blood loss, either from a diverticular bleed or very few bleed or a retro tumor or polyp that has fallen off. Sometimes postoperatively in an astomotic bleed, after colonoscopy polypectomy, it could be a polypectomy site bleed. You know, so that would be acute, acute blood loss. Okay? Does that answer the question? Uh, yes, doctor. Thank you very much, doctor. Okay. Yes. Uh, I think oh, I think that is mostly it. Oh yeah. Um. So just a uh, out of curiosity, la, Um. It's very non-specific, but from the history, he did mention that there's right iliac for some pain and yeah. without any uh I/O symptoms. Uh, yeah. And then I do see a, a few uh, colorectal carcinoma patients presenting with just abdominal pain itself. Can it be that there is, um, you need to suspect whether there is any adhesions to surrounding structure that is causing the pain? And surprisingly, it, it relieves with positional change sometimes with some patients. Yeah. Um, well, uh, you, if you have this abdominal pain, uh, especially radiating to the flanks, you must think about whatever that's in the flanks. Number one, it could be your ascending or descending colon. Number two, it can be a small bowel that's trapped onto the right or left side. Number three, it could be your ureters. You can have, and in, in this case, he had hydronephrosis. The tumor has blocked. The tumor has stretched his ureter so much that it has uh, decreased the caliber, and then there is a hydronephrosis. So obstructive uropathy is a symptom where you can get flank pain. Um, do you have another question or? Oh, I'm sorry, no. Thank uh, you. No worries, no worries. So, um, yeah. Uh, I'm not gonna. So, seeing that there's no more questions, we shall end our Q&A here today. So, before we 
uh, any session, please do leave your feedback in the feedback form, the link which I have left in the chat, or you can just scan this QR code. And any feedbacks that you provide will further improve further sessions in the future. So a soft copy of the uh, slides that have been amended will be emailed to you after you have completed the feedback form. And yeah, that concludes the session today. Once again, thank you so much, Dr. Nora, for uh, giving us the time for, especially during a weekend and to educate this, or especially on corrected bleeding. So once again, thank you so much and um, have a pleasant weekend, Doctor. Can I see a take home message? Ah, sure, sure, sure. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. <laughs> sorry about that. PR bleed, anyone, no matter what age, please check it out. Okay, it can be hemorrhoid, but don't ignore it until you know it is hemorrhoid. Okay, until you know that it's not colon cancer, please check it out. Anybody with PR bleeding, don't assume, don't um, don't compound the health belief by oh it's hemorrhoid, it's hemorrhoid. Don't never, please do that. Number two, anybody with um, any uh, body with an interest to do a colonoscopy screening, please do it, especially if you're more than fifty years old. Most likely, it's nothing for which you don't have to have another colonoscopy for another 10 years, okay? Mm. And remember that a screening is better than looking for symptoms. And now that you already have PR bleeding, please check your symptoms out. So that at that point, your PR bleeding, uh, getting a colonoscopy, that's no longer screening. That's like symptomatic or diagnostic, okay? You need to have it. So whoever, relatives or friends that you know of with complaints like this, please go ahead and advise accordingly. Okay, because we, we really want to reduce the statistics. We don't want to see stage three, stage four cancers in our lives <laughs> anymore. Because it's highly <laughs> preventable. Okay? If you if you did see a polyp, you take the polyp out, you prevent the polyp from becoming a cancer five to ten years down the line. So it's it's completely preventable. You can you can screen for this. Uh, don't 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 uh, condone any health belief until you have checked it out. Okay, that's my take message. All right. Yeah. So once again, thank you, Dr. Noah, for the very very insightful session. And um, the take home message is is yeah, it's kind of sad sometimes we see stage three and four colorectal cancer patients coming late. Um, yeah, that is it for our session today. So. Thank you all and also specifically. Oh, uh, oh yeah, thanks, uh, Dr. Nora. Uh, yeah, so a lot of hand claps there. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Okay, thank you, everyone. Have a good week. Thank you, Dr. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Thank you.